You're listening to the Mormon Faircast, brought to you by Fair Mormon. This episode of the Mormon Faircast features an interview with Nyland McBain, who is the author of the book Women at Church. Nyland McBain grew up a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in New York City and attended Yale University. She has been published in Newsweek, Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought, Segola, Meridian Magazine, and the Washington Post, to name a few. Nyland is the founder and editor-in-chief of the Mormon Women Project, a continuously expanding library of interviews with LDS women found at mormonwomen.com. She's also a brand strategist at a marketing and advertising firm in Salt Lake City. Nyland is the author of a collection of personal essays entitled How to Be a 21st Century Pioneer Woman, as well as Sisters Abroad, Interviews from the Mormon Women Project. She lives with her husband and three young daughters in Utah. Welcome, Nyland. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming in. So your bio definitely speaks volumes about your passions and support in wanting to highlight or spotlight Mormon women. So where, where did you kind of first feel the sparks of that passion? Well, I think because of my rather unusual upbringing as the daughter of a, the, of, uh, the only child of a professional Mormon woman, I think uh, the passion really was sparked when I realized that the way I had been brought up uh, didn't necessarily support the stereotypes that a lot of other Mormon women were, were uh, sort of being uh, conditioned to to uh, accept. Uh, for themselves. And so uh, I saw some some tension around that early on, sort of when I went off to college. And uh, as, I, as I went into adult years, I saw that more and more. And so I think as, that, as those experiences came to me and as I was responded to them, I, I realized that I thought I had something to offer in, in that realm because I had had these unusual role models and these ex- unusual experiences growing up. And this was all up in upstate New York or just in or Manhattan? Manhattan. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up right in New York wow. City. Um, yeah. There was a small, uh, a, you know, and this was sort of late 70s through the 80s, early 90s. And um, the church was rather exotic in New York at that time. It seemed very far away from Utah, you know. Um, and I think the it really it really helped me gain an understanding that the the lived church experience happens in the ward and stake, right? Um, when it comes down to it, our faith is is primarily uh, nurtured and developed and, and formed by the relationships that we have on the local level. So it was your experience even early on that the church, the LDS Mormon experience has a lot of different variety to it, not just the what you see in Utah. Absolutely. And, you know, people, I think, who have lived abroad in, and experienced, Americans who have lived, experienced church uh, in other international communities will, of course, tell you the same thing. And so, you know, in on the one hand, of course, it is true what, what visitors say, you know, when they're sobbing through their testimonies, the church is the same everywhere. And it's so <laughs> wonderful to be able to walk into the church in, you know, Kiev and have it be the same. as And, and of course, that's true. And I have had that experience myself. Um and it's very moving, but at the same time, of course, there there are um, differences even within the American church, depending on where you are geographically and uh, the personality of various leaders, the way the ward comes together. So when you're you're doing all these different projects involving women in the church, you've even had this book where you talk about uh, international experiences mm-hmm. with women. In in some ways, it sounds like that also went into inform your writing of the book Women at Church. I think I think that's true. It's interesting that for the first in what I hope is going to be a series of books uh, with the Mormon Women Project through through Pathos, uh, that I did choose to profile sisters abroad, and and I think that the women from the twenty two different countries that we've profiled so far on the Mormon Women Project have probably been among the most inspiring interviews for me because I think they do bear testimony to the need that these women these women have to develop their faith and their relationship with Jesus Christ outside of the church structure because the church structure is simply not as robust in many of the places where these women live um, as it is for us. We've interviewed women, you know, in India and um, some some very far away places, not just, you know, Canada and Mexico. So, um, you know, the church, the church is a very different feeling there. And I know that, that when our institutional leaders think about what is best for the church, they often have that really international perspective that sometimes I think those of us in America who haven't had experiences like that can, can lose sight of. So I think 
interviewing international women has been a very powerful experience for me. And so I did choose to highlight some of those interviews in my first uh, book. And um, it was also meaningful to me that Sylvia Allred, who was a counselor under Julie Beck in the General Relief Society mm-hmm. presidency, agreed to write the introduction for that book because I thought that you know having her in the presidency was such a great symbol for all of our women uh, all over the world that this is a global church. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, we're here to talk about your book, Women at Church, uh, subtitled Magnifying LDS Women's Local Impact. This book, at least from my reading of it, was designed to give people the opportunity to rethink assumptions about the subject of women in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So this understanding then that we're moving forward with your background, that this book is about magnifying this the, the LDS women and their impact, based on what I'm reading from a variety of sources, there's there's a lot of room for improvement here. In fact, uh, I believe your opening statement, your opening sentence is, is a pretty clear thesis. It's probably one of the clearest I've read in a long time. It says, this book is predicated on a single belief that there is much more we can do to see, hear, and include women in the church. Now, as I read that, I won- wondered about one word in the sentence, and that word was the word much. There's much more we can do. So I'm curious, how, how bold and italicized and underlined was the word much? That's interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I've ever paid that specific sort of objective attention to to that word before. You know, I think um, I think that the idea of the book is problem solving, right? It's it's okay. an approach to problem solving. The leaders in our wards and stakes in this in this country right now are already working so hard, right? It, it's a it's a thankless job. It's a it's a job that we have little training for. It's a job that takes a lot of intuition as well as spiritual direction. That said, each person's leadership style is very different, and there, and as, as I said earlier, there is a there's a wide range of styles and personalities even within this country. But at, at its core, I think being a bishop or a Relief Society president or primary president or a counselor is about problem solving, right? It's about how do we how do we take the people under our stewardship and create for them the best experience that they can have in their religious community, so as to support their spiritual development, right, and their faith, their faith and their spiritual um, nourishment in life. And so I think I, I would never put a cap necessarily on how imaginative we could be as leaders. There are many, many things that I haven't even thought of and that haven't yet been shared uh, in discussing this book that I think individual leaders could do to serve the needs of their individual congregations. But what this is a call to do is simply change our awareness and our attitudes about the way we use our structure and the way we include women in our structure. So I don't know that there is a quantifiable way of, you know, defining what that that much is. Um, I'll tell you, you know, uh, for, for me, one of the things that really was meaningful about my growing up experience in the church is just how how much above and beyond my leaders really went to show me, uh, as a young woman specifically, that uh, that I really had tremendous potential, and they, that they supported me in whatever I, I I decided to do and wherever my path my path led. I just think about you know some of the 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 amount of effort that went into supporting me as a young woman really is humbling to me. And so whether those are you know, whether a, a, a leadership decides to do those exact same things that I experienced or whether they just tailor them to their own, I think the call really is challenge yourself. Challenge yourself to see other possibilities and see uh, see a new approach to the visibility and the public awareness of women in our communities. Okay. I, I actually wanted to start with the cover of the book. Okay, I yes. don't normally talk about the covers of books, aside from it being kind of this warm, fuzzy paper. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that I had no control over, but I do like it. Uh, but the, there's a, a very interesting painting that you've included on the cover that I actually find to be incredibly gripping. And I don't, again, I don't always say much about the cover, but based on the title of the art and what it depicts, it actually speaks to the theme of your book. Absolutely. So why don't you kind of talk about the the cover? So one of the things that we really try and do in the Mormon Women Project is support the 
uh, work of Mormon women, the professional work of Mormon women. And there are a number of um, humanitarian projects that, you know, women involved in humanitarian projects that we've featured through the MWP. And I personally have loved getting to know about those organizations and support those organizations. And we kind of encourage our our community to do that. We do the same with um, artists, writers, uh, Mormon women who are, who, who are, who have professional ambitions. Um, and Caitlin Connolly is an, an artist who is living in Provo right now. And uh, when I was thinking about what I wanted on the cover of the book, and and as as my publisher, Greg Coford Books, can tell you, my, my editor's there, I was very vocal from the beginning of this project that I wanted to have a very beautiful cover um, because I do think it makes a, a difference, and I am a marketer, so that's, <laughs> yes. that's important to me. Day job. Um, and so kind of through the process of... of um, writing the book, I was looking for a, a specific work by an LDS woman that I could feature. And I give credit for finding that specific painting to um, one of my editors, Riley Lorimer, who who directed me to that painting specifically. Uh, and since we landed on that painting, I've become good friends with Caitlin and, and you know, sort of talked to her about the work and learned about how she, she crafted it. And um, and it, it's it's uh, I'm I'm very proud to be supporting her and endorsing her. That image in particular struck me because um, I the book one of the theses of the book is that women in the church do kind of hold two truths. And the the, the title the, the of the title. painting is "Women Debating Two Truths." Exactly. I talk a lot about the the paradoxes of being an LDS woman in the 21st century. Um, some of those paradoxes are that we are, on the one hand, encouraged to go out and experience the world in its entirety and in its, its fullness and in its divine richness. We're told to get as much education as we can. Um, the line that we are told to, uh, you know, prepare to support ourselves in the case of our husband's death is heard less and less. You know, a lot, a lot more. It's about, you know, the emotional fulfillment and 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 the reality, of course, is today that that. Um, that many women will will have to support themselves, but there's a there's a sort of emphasis now on there being many reasons why a woman might choose to to do something outside of that you know uh, uh, single era of mothering young children. Um, and uh, in addition to that paradox, oh, of course, the other side of that paradox is the 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 um, the experience in the church structure, which may today be the only place a young girl experiences um, things being off limits to her because of her gender. So, you know, and yet that is where we are finding our spiritual truth. You know, it's in that community that is telling us that there's something that's objectively off limits to us. That's a fact. We can't deny that there are things that are off limits to us as women in the church. And and so that can create some some tension or some sort of paradox that, that a woman in the church today has to hold. And she has to hold one on each hand and kind of balance them out constantly, day to day, you know, um, the lived experience and the church experience. Of course, also another paradox that I talk about is the idea that um, Joseph Smith and the Restoration produced this idea that that he was turning the key to women for the for the opening of women's empowerment not just in the church I mean I make a I make a strong point that really most of the benefits that have come to women over the past 200 years have really fallen under that time frame of the founding of the Relief Society's organization you know that was when we really saw a, a huge just um, torrent of changes for for women in the world, and specifically, of course, in America, but but um, also in the world abroad. And so we have that, and I call it, I think, a, a rev- this explosion, you know, of of, of um, revolutionary uh, thought about gender um, from Joseph Smith. And then we have to kind of again balance that against this idea that we we are obedient to to what the church now is. Um, and so I think for a woman in the church today, there are some tensions that she has to kind of come to, to come to terms with. And, and for me, um, as I think for, for most people, most women in the church today, it seems we've come to recognize that the gospel and the, our membership in the church offers us so much more than simply those limited uh, opportunities for for presiding and for uh, exercising priesthood authority, and so for us, 
you know, there is that, the, 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 the balance is, is worth it, you know, and, um, but I do love that image of, of the work that a, a contemporary Mormon woman is engaged in every day. Yeah. So with this theme that we're talking about here, with women talking about discussing these two different truths and trying to figure out how those work together, like what you just referenced, we have even further the theme of feminism, uh, a term that people throw around a lot today. Uh, it, it has a, I would call it a wardrobe of interpretations that attempt to clothe a given message. <laughs> yes. But because there's so many different versions of feminism, uh, could you please take a minute to describe your own interpretation of what that is and how you frame yourself with reference to it? Because some people will think, gosh, this sounds like a feminist type thing, and, mm -hmm. and do you consider yourself that way? Well, I will first point out that the the word feminism or feminist does not appear anywhere in the book, and that was very intentional. And the reason is because I didn't want uh, the intended audience for the book um, to be at, put off at all by the use of a term that can bring some baggage with it, um, and that is widely misunderstood. It can be divisive to Absolutely. some people, yeah. And I think the reason it can be divisive, and I'll, so I'll start with that. I'll, I'll start with the reason it can be divisive if, if, is because of the pesky IST or ISM on the on the end of the word, um, which which um, rhetorically sets the word apart as uh, a separate sep separating word, right? Um, if a feminist can be uh, understood to be an activist, right, or or somebody who sets themselves apart from the mainstream because perhaps they they think that there's a better way, right. right? And that's very antithetical to sort of our our, our warm fuzzy church. Well, it's not church very Zion. It's not. It, it isn't. And um, and even if that even if that effort, uh, which I think you know nine times out of ten is intended with the best spirit and the best feeling of trying to move us forward towards Zion, um, I think that it can be construed as as a, a separating or a proclamation that, that I know better. Um, and for that reason, I think that uh, the word isn't what I was, was going for with this book. Um, I also think, though, that um, the word feminism can connote for us other negative words that suggest behaviors that are non-normative or the, that we don't want to participate in, such as racism and sexism sure. and, um, you know, uh, all sorts of negative things that sort of end in that ISM uh, or a racist or a sexist. You know, somebody we, – we use those terms to, 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 again, to designate people who are separate from the normative behavior, right, who are kind of aberrations or per per participating behavior that we do not approve of, right? Right. So even though, you know, um, for many people who identify as feminists and, and, and adhere to feminism as one of their ideological beliefs, I think – they of course are are using the word as a complete opposite of that. I think rhetorically that that for those who are not familiar with the term, those negative connotations do come to mind. So, so you, you didn't want to bring that baggage into exactly, your book. Exactly. Exactly. The truth remains that we are one of the only Western religions to proclaim and celebrate a female deity. We are one of the only Western religions that um, that you know, abundantly discusses the divine um, perpetuity of, of, of women's identity as, as female spirits. Um, and From the preexistence from, exactly, even on, yeah. Exactly, and, and that there's tremendous worth in that, um, equal worth, in fact. And, of course, you know, the, the whole approach to Eve is radical and, and revolutionary in Western religion. So the truth remains that um, anybody who believes that a woman has the um, earthly and spiritual right to fulfill her potential to pursue interests, hobbies, passions in safe spaces where she is has um, um, abundant opportunities open to her. In fact, similar opportunities open to her as as men. Then. That is a feminist, right? And in that in that sense, I think doctrinally we are obligated to be feminists, right? Um, and and many Mormon Mormons who say that they are feminists do that because of our doctrine. Um, and 
uh, many people who become feminists, many Mormons who become feminists, say they become feminists become, because of our doctrine. So, so it's an extremely useful and appropriate word in that, in that sense. But as you've pointed out already, you know, it can take on any one of those huge sure. spectrums of meaning. Um, and so my point was I wanted to show that we could have this entire conversation without using that word because this isn't about whether you adhere to, you know, a certain set of um, of mechanics, right, for achieving the sure. goal of women's full potential. What this is is a conversation about the fact that every single one of us has a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, a self, right? Right. Who has to confront these these issues every day, and that's what I wanted to focus the conversation on. Yeah, and and it's difficult though, and understandably so, because I know if you hear of someone that promotes something that says, say, white power, we go, "You're a racist," mm-hmm. not a "You're a whitest." <laughs> but with a women, with a woman, you can see someone saying "women power" and they're a feminist, yes. and that's okay. Yes. And so it's not always equal when you when you deal with these ISTs and ISMs. And yes. so your book is certainly calling for what I would term more of an interdependent relationship between the genders in achieving, a, as we talked about, a Zion, more Zion type approach, a unified type approach. So it, it's your clear assumption in, in reading the book, and anybody that would read this is, is going to find this out right off the bat, that you feel that women are not being heard. And it's in the same first chapter where you state that a, a good portion of your book is going to talk about the problem. And the problem, again, is that some women are feeling neglected, overlooked, and silenced in their church experiences. Is it that these women are feeling neglected and overlooked and silenced by men, by other women, or by both? Both. Both. You know, it's very interesting because, of course, a lot has been made of the fact, and many people are, are quick to say, that that they don't know women who, who are feeling that they do not have a voice at, at church. And I, I think I'm, I think I, you know, focus in the beginning part of the book, too, on the fact that this is a real and honorable feeling to have and it, and that many of our women do feel that way the the concern is that there are there are optics there are visual impressions that belie the work that women already do in the church and that in our contemporary age the lack of that public recognition will at some point start to grate on a woman or on her daughters or on her granddaughters. So I, the, the, there is no effort at all, quite the contrary, to disclaim any of those uh, satisfactions that women feel in, in the church. Again, on the contrary, um, the church produces remarkable women. Uh, women feel remarkably at home in the church, and and that is wonderful. Um, again, though, we can objectively state that although their voice may be may be heard, there are still places where visually she is not seen. There are places where she cannot act as a voice for the church. There are places where she cannot be seen as a role model to younger women. There, there will always be places uh, under our current structure where she will not make the financial or administrative decisions. Um, there are places where her her stewardship is not uh, yet fully her own um, or re- respected as her own. You know, we we have situations uh, that, I, that I hear about a lot where, you know, a primary president or a Relief Society president will ask for certain women to be involved in their organizations, um, you know, having prayerfully considered who counselors or teachers might be. And, you know, I... Th- and then, and then she's hurt when, you know, the bishop or the state president or whatever says, "Oh, I'm sorry, that woman's off limits to you." Well, why is she off limits if she, if that woman has stewardship over half the ward, you know, full stewardship over the fifty percent of the women in the ward? Sometimes that can that that can create this idea for a woman that she may not be as heard as she thought she was, you know. Um, and I, I've heard over the past several years many women who got, kind of go through that process um, and feel that that they are not that not heard as, as, as much as they thought they were on the, on, on the flip side, 
Um, I've heard a lot of stories. In fact, almost every interview I did with a woman for this book brought up the fact that um, women can be their own worst enemies in, in this, uh, that, that women sometimes can hold back other women who are trying to think imaginatively and who are trying to create some of those um, more inclusive public tableaus, you know, and, and improve the optics of, of, of how our, our women are represented in our, our worship. I think, I, thought that, I think this is fascinating, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. And I, I've kind of come to the conclusion that, you know, there, there really are not many of us who aren't negotiating for power in some way. You know, even the, even the woman who says that she's perfectly uh, content and, and is treated exceptionally well in her ward and stake still feels that she's ex- treated well because she feels powerful in her own sphere, right? And I, and I, so I don't think that it's, that women are, are not trying to negotiate power. I think, I think that sometimes we can feel threatened when the sphere of that power is stretched or enlarged and we don't quite feel safe anymore. And so when a, another woman comes in and says, look, I think we need to expand the impact of our young women's organization, or I think we should propose that our young women go off and do something new, and I think that they should become the ushers, or they should pass the microphone, or they should, you know, do a, a choir number once a month in sacrament meetings so that they can be seen and be recognized by the ward members. I think that that when we move into new solutions like that, that can sort of um, shake the the balance of power that we're comfortable with. And I think that that can feel scary and sometimes and, and a little bit threatening. And and the, really that's what I've come up with. I, I'm sure everybody would have a different interpretation of why that, that happens. But um, from what I've seen and from what I've studied, that's why I think both men and women are, are responsible for some of the situation we're in today. And I think that we both can provide solutions. Now you keep using this word power. And and I'm I'm curious because... Power tends to be something that comes in a in secular applications. Power at work, they because they're they're your boss, and then there's power in political situations because of seniority or position in in a civic organization or state or you know federal level. And so I'm kind of curious as to uh, the place of the use the use of the word power with respect to an all volunteer organization like the church. Mm-hmm. Is it your assumption then that power is something that people in the church should seek? No, not at all. But what I'm saying is I think, well, there, there are two ways that I'm talking about power. And the way I'm talking about it is in its best sense. In its best sense, power is the sense of knowing that you are doing God's will okay. and that you are spiritually fulfilled and that you are certain in your identity. That, that is what – so when I'm saying that we fun, when, we're, when we feel powerful in a certain sphere, what I mean is that we feel that we, have, we are contributing to what, something we love and that our contribution is being accepted. Okay. Um, and I think that when, that when that dynamic happens, we gain confidence in our identity, right, as daughters or sons of God. In its worst sense, though, power is a currency, volunteer organizations um, that, 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 is, that is wielded in volunteer organizations because that's all we have, right? You can't, you can't ask for a pay raise or a promotion. Right. So I, I think that— um, And what is a promotion even? Right, right. Um, so I think, I think that in, its, in, in worst cases, you know, p- power is used as the, uh, the indicator of that influence. And, and I think that— most of us in the church are so good about um, acknowledging that, you know, we, we are working as a community. There's the, the the great the great image of the stake president, you know, being called to be nursery leader after he's released from being stake president. We believe that and we love that and we celebrate that. But I do think that in some situations that because power is our currency – it can be abused and it can be sought for in inappropriate ways. But when I talk when I when I was talking about power earlier, I was definitely talking about this idea of like, you know, for a woman to feel powerful at church, she needs to feel that um, she's being she's offering something and it's being generously received. Um, not only generously received, but that she's being given the opportunity to see her vision fully developed, right? And I think that that sometimes is what we don't fully honor. 
And one one of the things that you address in the book, especially in the in part one, because there's part one and part two. So in part one, one of the main issues that you address is this issue of hurt or pain that women are feeling because of these things that we've talked about. And and of course, there's multiple accounts that you give in this this first part, and we don't really have time to go through all of them. But it's it's interesting to me after talking with uh, Terrell and Fiona Givens, and uh, have you read their new book, by Not the way? Not the new one. No, okay. I just got it the other night. There's a, there's a section in the book that talks about the utility of suffering mm. and how discipleship is incomplete without it. And here you are talking about hurt mm-hmm. and suffering. And it makes me see these two different things about hurt and suffering in two very different situations. In theirs, it seems to be uh, trying to find the use for it in building up the individual. You're seeing these hurts and these things happen and applying it to the church organizationally. At least that's my interpretation of why you brought out these these stories in part one. Mm-hmm. And, it, and frankly, it, it is hurtful to read these things. It's mm-hmm. painful. You have to sit with these very uncomfortable experiences for the first part of the book. So I'm, I want to ask you the question then, what then do you see as the utility of the hurt, of the, the suffering that people have? What's the end goal that we can, can use to, to get the most out of these experiences? Well, I think, you know, I haven't, I haven't read Terrell and Fiona's new book, but I think from what you're telling me right now and from what um, I know of from from being friends with Fiona, I think uh, one of the one of the distinctions I would I would draw is that the idea of the church being a sanctuary and a refuge is a little bit different than when we say we are suffering individually to sort of, you know, refine ourselves and 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 um, um, acquire more godlike characteristics. Uh, I think the world will always do a plentiful job of of, 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 providing, of, of providing those <laughs> opportunities. What I think we all hope for is that the church will be a refuge from that, right? And and in many ways, our faith is relational. I talk about this a little bit in the book. Our faith is relational. It's not transactional, right? Faith uh, is a living relationship. I would assume that that their new book talks about this a little bit as well, the, the crucible of doubt. This idea that that your faith is, um, you know, um, ebbs and flows, and we talk about nourishing a testimony a lot in church, and that one of those paradoxes that we live with in the church, which which Terrell's actually talked about before, is this idea that you know we are on a, an eternal progression, a developing and becoming like God, and 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 developing our own assuredness. That he lives and that that and that we can be like him. And yet, on the other hand, we'll stand up in church and we'll say, "I know the church is true." You know, how can those two things coexist when you know something right now, contrasted with this idea of of eternal progression? Well, I think that you know, uh, I I certainly fall more on the idea of this continual ladder um, that Joseph Smith referenced of of progressing uh, to. To, to ever-growing knowledge. And, and part of that for me is this idea that, that my relationship with faith um, is, is a relationship with this institution, right? It's almost like right. a marriage, right? It, I mean, you can have, you know, a marriage is the institutional bond between two people, and it's within that institution that two people will explore their relationship to each other. Um, the institution is important for us because... It's what distinguishes religion from spirituality. You know, I mean, we can people people say that they're spiritual, but for us, it's important to be, be both spiritual and religious because religion is what brings in the community element. It's what brings in that relational element of having to work out your faith with other people. And I guess my hope would be that that we could relieve suffering and relieve pain there so that we could be better equipped and better supported and better propped up for when the world brings us the crucible that it will bring us in inevitably. Yeah. Now, one of the other themes in the first part of the book is this call for greater empathy from church membership for those that are struggling with various kinds of hurt. The Savior even called for the same thing in his day. So one could argue that seeking for greater 
charity is a cause that will really, it'll never end. We're, we're always looking for ways to be more charitable. Uh, and discipleship for, for men and women both uh, tends to be kind of based on this metaphorical scale. You talked about this where there's an individual responsibility, there's a spirituality that we hold, but there's also this interdependent community that discipleship requires, at least it seems. How then do you place that balance? How, I mean, it sounds to me like you're calling for these different things for as a church and as memberships to do. So where does that balance come in when we're dealing with someone with hurt? How do we approach someone and say, you know, this is really kind of your thing. You, you got to handle this on your own versus, here, let's work on this together. I, I mean, I think that, that that's um, really figuring out that balance or that paradox, shall we say, holding those two things in our hands as the cover of the book shows is, from my point of view, one of the defining elements of being a member of the church in this day and age. And it's not just because of this conversation around women. This idea of, you know, what what is our absolute truth and to what point do we need to adhere to that letter of the law? Um contrasted with, you know, at what point can we just put our arms around that person and embrace them and accept them? That, I mean, that that is at the core of so many of the social conversations that are happening in the church today. Certainly the, the conversation around gay marriage, you know, um, and, and, and the conversation around women is, you know, we're, we're, we're in the process of balancing, of figuring out where on the scale do we lie between, you know, absolute letter of the law, we will show no compassion, this is the way it is, and sorry, take it or leave it, versus this will take you however you are, you know, um, and we'll accept you no matter what. One of the things that was really important, there's a line in the book that was really important to me. And it was just one line, but it was it really reflects uh, a sort of internal conversation I've had about this 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 balance. And it's the line where I say that um, Jesus Christ was the most grown up grown up that we ever <laughs> okay, yeah. um, have encountered in history. And I I kind of came to that conclusion because I was uncomfortable with with the description of Christ being either one of those extremes. Christ you know, was demanding. We, I just finished, um, reading Matthew 13, uh, with my, with my girls and, um, they're, they're young and we were struck by the forceful language, the wheat and the tares and, you know, the parables of the dividing of the kingdom that are in that chapter and what will happen to those, you know, bad seeds. (laughs) Um, and it's very forceful and throughout the savior's language, there is absolute, undeniable um, right and wrong. At the same time, of course, we have ample examples of him, you know, bucking the, the, the expectations of the day to go out of his way to embrace a particular sinner or somebody who particularly fell outside of the social norm. And so his life itself challenges us to, to you know, ask ourselves, where, where does he lie on that spectrum, right? Right. And so when we're trying to apply that same spectrum to modern day life, we we find ourselves struggling and saying, okay, what would Jesus do? Well, uh, you know, that and that's why I have kind of come to this conclusion that he was neither all embracing nor was he draconian, but he was just mature. He was he took each situation and he really approached it, you know, without a lot of um, emotional biases. He really approached it with an eye for, you know, can I embrace this person? Sometimes no, but if he could, he did, right? And I, I, I see that that's our responsibility today. If we can, we must. But um, for some people, what that line is, is is going to be different. Well, and I think Elder Oaks attempted to address this very thing with his talk in conference. I think it was called Of Love and Law or Love and Law, something mm-hmm. like that, yeah. where it was that, that these are not two polar opposites, that if we consider one or the other we're missing the boat yes. that that god loves us because he has and he has laws because he loves us rather yes and so it's it's that balance that that i think people are finding difficult to to balance part of that ends up being because we see a lot of secular ideas and secular discussions trying to be 
squeezed into or crammed into a gospel mindset. And that becomes the danger that a lot of people have, again, going back to the use of the word feminism and things like that, because what we're dealing with is how do we separate the world's wisdom from inspired practices and Mm -hmm. teachings. Now, with that being said, well, let's get into part two of the book, which is example after example of people who have embraced certain changes on a more local level and things that people have done uh, that people have done to adapt to the equality that is inherent in church teachings. I I saw what you were doing in part two, and it reminded me of DNC 5827, the people that are anxiously engaged in a good cause and doing things on their own free Free will. will, yes. So why don't you give us an example or two of what we'd be reading in part two? Well, I'd say the, over, the the principle that I would love people to come away from part two with is um, a, an approach to church administration that takes the handbook and instead of saying, well, does the handbook say I can do this? Uh, if not, then I'm not going to try it, you know, and shifts that approach to, well, the handbook doesn't say I can't. So I'm going to try and see. It's not commanded in all things, Yes, right? not commanded in all things. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought that scripture up because that is at the heart of the spirit of part two. Um, and, and I'll give a couple of examples too, but I also, wanted, I also want to say that, well, it's been funny, a couple of lawyers have pointed out to me over the past couple of weeks Uh-oh. that a very similar discussion occurs <laughs> in constitutional law, right? Uh, it's this idea of how, how, do you, how do you read things. But the, the idea is that... Um, that we have more, we have more opportunity than I think we take advantage of. That we don't necessarily have to put ourselves in some of the situations that we find ourselves in. And 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 I took this approach for two reasons. The first was that I see a lot of our contemporary leaders today doing their own part to really encourage members to think more expansively about what men and women have in common as opposed to our differences. There's a lot of talk about different roles, different responsibilities, how men and women are different. And um, again, gender doctrine is is essential to us, and um, we we have to embrace that, and there's a lot of beauty in it. However, there have also been uh, a number of talks and books recently about how much we are similar. And I think I think there's an effort to, uh, on the general level, uh, improve the public visibility of women. And I point out several of those things in the book. Um, the inclusion of uh, the apostles' wives up on the stand at the last general conference. They moved all the female general officers into the middle uh, to, to, again, improve the optics, improve the, the, the vision, the tableau of, of what we see in our worship. You know, and, and some people, and, and I could go on. There was a, a number of things, and some people will say those are only superficial things, but cosmetic changes. cosmetic changes. But you know, my my point again is that those things matter. You know, we live in a culture of visible role models. We live in a culture where any one of our daughters can, you know, join the Twitter feed of anybody from Hillary Clinton to Beyonce, you know, and and join her tribe and consider her to be a role model. And and if we're gonna if we're gonna compete with that, very literally, you know, I mean, if we're being very practical and we're saying if we're gonna compete with that, we need to just bump up the sheer number of female role models that we are offering our girls and women. So I took I took a cue from that, and I also took a cue from the idea that many of our uh, beloved programs started off at the grassroots level. And, you know, again, this is this is one of those paradoxes that we struggle with. We follow the prophet and we're obedient. And yet primary, seminary, family home evening, you know, so many of these things started from members taking initiative and solving problems that they saw um, in in the needs of their own, the people that they were stewards over and people in their own communities. So, so again, that's one of those things that we have to balance, and and I think for many, uh, for so much of the 20th century, we've, we've um, the pendulum has been, um, I won't say exclusively, but it's very heavily weighted towards you know when the prophet speaks, the thinking is is done, right? Um, we had we had that circulating for a while, and now. Um, I even think, though that was heavily, it was heavily disputed, disputed even by yeah. George Albert Smith when it was said. Yes, yeah. but it lived on as a as a 
you know, a urban urban myth, a urban legend. <laughs> yeah. Um, to to swinging a little bit more towards this idea that we are stewards of our own experiences and that we are agents of of and responsible for for that community experience ourselves. Oh, the, the, you asked for specific examples, yes. though. That's where I was going. Um, so, you know, uh, I, the big caveat is this is just a sampling of the kinds of ideas. Uh, first of all, this is intended to be a conversation starter uh, that that people can bring to their own leadership, can talk about within their own words and stakes and families, and come up with their own ideas, right, ideas that are right for them. Also, we started a website called womenatchurch.com where people can come and submit their own stories of things that are working well in their words and stakes, and they can read stories from other people uh, of things that are working well in their own, their own words and stakes, and they're all anonymous. It's just the idea is just that it's a sort of crowdsourced library of things that are working. Okay. Um, but, you know, in the interviews that I did, uh, a number of things that came up were uh, following the example in general conference of having the female officers of the stake and the ward sit up on the stand for stake and ward conference. Uh, you know, uh, in mixing up the speaker uh, order so that it isn't implied that the woman is the youth speaker and the man the man gives the big doctrinal you know sermon. Oh, the beginning. And uh, end. Yes, gotcha. exactly. So, so um, a number of leaders that I've talked with are are mixing that up. Um, there's also a sensitivity to not necessarily giving a woman a platform either at state conference, word conference, in a in a particular calling simply because of who she's married to. Right. So looking at either the, the professional or the spiritual or the volunteer skills of an individual woman and not just saying, well, she's married to the stake president, so we're going to have her speak sort of thing. There's a lot of sensitivity around that. Um, the idea of, you know, are women, are girls preparing for missions now? A lot of stake presidents and bishops and Relief Society presidents, young women's presidents are really looking seriously at the fact that we're preparing girls to be uh, ecclesiastical authorities and leaders and doctrinal uh, doctor and scriptorians, and um, they they're you know playing with the idea of sending young women to be visiting teachers with their mothers or assigning them to. I've, I've heard of both situations, either with their mothers or with other women in the ward, um, just as the boys have been done, sure. has been done with the boys, um, introducing the girls into relief society earlier on. Um, this is one that that really struck home for me because I was in a relief society presidency in college where, you know, the, the, that abrupt change from young women's to Relief Society was really evident to me. Um, and it's not something that the boys experience as profoundly. With all this talk about change in the church uh, or just changes that people can can look to or be more open in their thinking about how to approach this, there are those that will be scared, you know, oh, here comes another, yep. you know, revolutionary and things like that. And one of the changes that has been brought out recently is the call for uh, women to be ordained to the priesthood. Mm -hmm. You actually have a, a part of your book where you talk about that as a as an outcome or a possibility, but it's different than what people may think. What's your take on women getting ordained to the priesthood? Well, I think I think I address it as an outcome or a possibility, and simply that I don't ever say that it won't happen, right? I think I always just say, if if that were to happen... Whatever. Great, whatever, yeah. Um, so I... But is it a solution? I, I, well, what are you solving for? If you, if, if that is what you propose as a solution, I'm not, I'm not sure what you're solving, f I'm not sure what you're solving for is the same as what I am trying to solve for. I'm trying to solve for something different. I'm trying to solve for men and women working cooperatively together in a way that allows each to fully feel like um, a contributing member of the church experience. That said, I spent 12 years in a, a all-girls school growing up. I'm a firm believer in the fact that there are valuable and helpful, uh, meaningful reasons for women to have spaces in which to f safely develop themselves. But I do feel that um, that there is wisdom in uh, the way our structure current could potentially, with with some of these adaptations, reflect the doctrinal need for the interdependence of men and women to proceed to exaltation together. And and I think that that it not only structurally could we could we you know 
expand our embrace of this cooperative model. But I think doctrinally, uh, talks like Elder Oaks are pointing us to a more interdependent definition of priesthood itself. You know, the, the, the priesthood is, is, is a difficult thing for people to wrap their heads around. It's, it's in, intangible. It's a, you know, it's a concept that, that we are right now um, really, really working to understand more fully. And I think members of the church always have, but we are working to understand it in a more interdependent context than simply a cut, cut and dry gendered context as we may have in the past. And I think that that's a really positive thing, but I think we can do that with our current structure. With that being said, let's, um, let's kind of give the last couple little points here. Something that we didn't mention at the beginning is something that you mentioned kind of, I don't want to call it in passing, but that the, the uh, proceeds from your book are not going to your pocket. No. Where are they going? They are going to support the Mormon Women Project, which is a 501c3 nonprofit, and um, the 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 money is useful to us because we uh, have conversations like this with the women that we interview, and then we transcribe them. And the transcription process, depending on the interview, can take anywhere from about four to twelve hours. And um, in the first year or two of the MWP's existence, uh, each of the volunteers who did the interviews did their own transcriptions and it it was a, it's an arduous task anybody who's transcribed knows it's arduous um, in addition we had some interviews that were being translated from other languages um, and so it would take up to 20 30 hours to produce an interview um, our goal is to produce uh, well up until I started writing the book, and at which time I kind of handed off some responsibilities, we were publishing one interview a week. So it's a it's a serious commitment. And so with the money, what we're able to do is not only to develop the site and you know pay pay the minimal costs that are required to keep up a site, uh, but we're a, we're able to pay for uh, transcription. And we have volunteer transcribers. Uh, they're 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 actually uh, LDS women who have have offered to do the transcription. But we can pay them a small sum to do the transcription so that our interview producers are no longer um, sort of uh, doing everything. Yeah. Yeah. And they got where they were getting very fatigued and we weren't able to keep volunteers for a long time and we weren't able to keep up with our publication schedule. So um, it's, it's, yeah, we're, we're very excited to be able to continue with that model from the proceeds of this book. So where can people pick up a copy of Women (laughs) at Church? Um, it is available on um, Coford Books, Greg Coford Books site. It's available on Amazon.com. It's available on DeseretBook.com. And it will be in Deseret Bookstores, I believe, in the next couple of weeks. I think it's also in some Siegel Bookstores um, as well. So I All over. That, all over, yeah. Excellent. And again, do you want them going to Women at Church or MormonWomen.com? WomenAtChurch.com which... will... Uh, will provide a, a gateway to submitting your own story. Mm-hmm. If you have an example of something that uh, is working well, please do write to us there. It also points you to the Mormon Women Project, so, you, so it's a gateway to that. Um, and you can read other stories through that site as well. Excellent. So thank you for tackling an incredibly difficult subject, <laughs> at least now. Today it's difficult. Um, but uh, again, Women at Church by Nyland McBain. Thanks again for coming in. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this interview with Nyland McBain, author of the book Women at Church. This book is available through the Fair Mormon Bookstore at bookstore.fairlds.org. The opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of Fair Mormon or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.